Hello, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, you are very welcome to a Food System Summit Dialogue titled The Role of Agricultural Biotechnology in Food Systems Transformation. Now, this is one of the many dialogues that will feed into the Food Systems Summit as part of a decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, food systems are pretty complex. There is systems within systems. There are different individuals and groups of industry and stakeholders that participate in it. And so one of the ideas of these food systems dialogues is to open it up to all of these different stakeholders and all of these different very important people that interact daily with the food systems. So what we're going to do here is that we've convened different experts and different uh, people from all parts of the food systems to talk a little bit about how one of the big sectors that is very important for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and how it's not only central to the commitment of leave no one behind, but it's also certain to the way we feed not just our communities, but also our countries and our nations. And so to explain a little bit about the process, um, we are gathered here to listen to different experts and to open it up for discussions. And after we do that, we there is a repertoire that will be taking note of all the conversations that happen, all of the different ideas and light bulbs that pop up. And hopefully we have great, great discussions. What we wanna do is talk about the role of ag innovations to transform the food systems. Now, We've got a great set of speakers for everyone here, and we encourage everyone at home and everybody tuning in online to submit your questions and to listen in for those key insights. What we want to do is also create red thread themes that will that we can all um, um, put together and upload to the Food System Summit Dialogue website. And that way it will feed into what happens in the Food System Summit. Um, I hope everyone is ready to hear some great and thrilling presentations, but mostly we want uh, everyone to engage. The idea of the Food System Summit is that we discuss these ideas on a horizontal level and that everyone gets input into them. So. Without further ado, I want to thank uh, every, all of the panelists first for uh, agreeing to be here. The Alliance for Science has convened this theme and Joseph Apokogakpo will serve as the facilitator and we will take notes and take all the great ideas that come out of here and upload them into our final report that will inform what happens at the Food Systems Summit. So thank you everyone for being here. I will hand it over to the facilitator here, Joseph Apokugakpo, um, who is a journalist at, in Ghana and has many years of experiences covering agricultural biotechnology. I will hand it over and thank you everyone for being here. Pablo, thanks very much for the opening statement and thanks to everyone for making time sure. for this. I know that um, all of us are joining from across the world in different places and the time zones may or may not be favorable, but uh, thanks very much to all of you for still making the time to be part of this. I think uh, we'll quickly move into the very first session that seeks to focus on the current impact of ag biotechnology in food systems transformation and a um, man that I have a lot of respect for, Graham Brooks, who is director at PG Committee in the UK, will actually be taking us through that. And then soon after that, uh, we would have our discussants also join the conversation. So uh, Dr. Brooks, the next 10 minutes is yours. Um, we're looking forward to your presentation. Are you seeing my presentation? Yes, we can see the screen. Great. Um, so, um, hello to everyone. Uh, whatever time of day it is to you, wherever you are in the world. Um, I am going to do a very quick presentation of some of the key findings of our last Global Impact of Biotech Crop report, which came out in the middle of, but this time last year. Um, the 
presentation can be made available to uh, anyone who wants it afterwards. I can provide a PDF copy of it, but uh, I'm going to whiz through a lot of the slides. Um, I am an agricultural economist. Um, I've been looking at the impact of biotech crops around the world now for well over 20 years. And since 2004, we've been trying to quantify the global impacts uh, from an economic perspective and um, an environmental perspective. And as a result of that, I'm an author now of uh, more than 30 papers on biotech crop impacts in peer reviewed journals. And the information I'm going to present to you is drawn from two peer review papers in the journal GM Crops and Food. The links are shown there. The papers are freely available. Um, you do not have to pay for access. They're on open access and a more detailed copy is available from our website. The period I'm going to cover covers up to 2018. We're looking at the socioeconomic impacts at the farm level and the environmental impact from two perspectives uh, associated with changes in pesticide use uh, oh, well, yeah. and oh, greenhouse gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, methodology, um, the, a lot of our work is based um, and draws on the considerable literature in um, peer reviewed journals. Um, and we use, make use of current prices, yields, exchange rates to ensure that you know, the analysis is as dynamic as possible. We review pesticide use um, and the changes in pesticide use. Um, and because pesticide use is a fairly poor indicator of environmental impact, we also use another indicator called the environmental impact quotient that was developed at Cornell in the 1990s. It allows you to make a better environmental impact assessment, although it's still fairly crude itself, um, but it's nevertheless better than just looking at changes in volumes used. And lastly, we review the impacts associated with carbon emission changes. This slide gives you the overview of the whole, right, the whole reports findings. Uh, over that 21 year period, the technology we estimate has contributed to the world using 776 million kilograms less pesticide active ingredient. That is an 8.6% reduction. But interestingly, if you look at it from an EIQ perspective, it is a larger 19% cut or benefit for the environment. For the farmers who've used the technology, they've increased their incomes by 225 billion US dollars. The world has also seen, as a result of the increased production in yields associated with the technology, 824 million tonnes more food, feed and fibre, mainly in the four main crops where the technology is used of corn, cotton, canola and soybeans. And lastly, um, in terms of carbon emissions, the figures for the latest year of our analysis uh, for 2018 shows that the um, carbon emission savings were equal to 23 billion kilograms less CO2 released into the atmosphere. Um, 2018, the farming income gain was $19 billion. Like, to give you some perspective, that's approximately equal to adding 5.8% to the global value of production of those four main crops. The average gain per farmer who's used the technology is $97 per hectare in extra farm income. And interestingly, you will see that farmers in developing countries have received more than 50% of that income gain. This slide just gives you an indication of the average farm income gains by country. The key points to take home from that is it's highly variable, um, but the highest average farm gains have tended to be farmers in developing 
countries. This next slide gives you a comparison of the farm income gains and the cost farmers, the extra cost farmers pay for technology in 2018. If there's one slide in my presentation that probably says more than any other, the reason why the farmers who use this technology repeatedly go back to using it and like using it, it is this slide. Across all users, you can see that for every extra dollar farmers spend on seed, they are getting a 3.75 extra dollars in income. So a 3.75% dollar return on every dollar invested. And in developing countries, the return on investment is even greater at $4.42 um, in extra income for every dollar invested in seed. Most of the farm income gains have come from yield gains. 70% um, of the yield gains have tended to come from insect resistant technology. And most of the cost savings have come from the herbicide tolerant technology. And as I mentioned earlier, the farm income gains, um, yield gains are, and yield gains are greatest in developing countries and the cost savings have tended to be greatest in developed countries. In relation to the insect resistant corn, this slide gives you the average yield gains, the average across all user countries, 16.5%. Same graph, average gain and yield nearly 14%. And insect resistant soybeans, which have been used since 2013 in South America, an average yield gain of nine and a half percent. I think it's also worth referencing that the herbicide tolerant traits have also contributed um, some yield improvements. And this slide gives you that information, mainly from better weed control, but it's also facilitated many farmers in South America getting a second crop of soybeans after wheat that they wouldn't have otherwise been growing because um, they are able to go into and adopt no tillage agriculture, which to, to some extent shortens the whole production cycle, allowing that extra crop to be got in. The extra yield, if you aggregate it up um, across the crops and the globe, this slide gives you that information and it shows that in that 21 year period, the world has got from using the technology an extra 278 million tonnes of soybeans, nearly 500 million tonnes more corn, uh, nearly 33 million tonnes more cotton lint, and just over 14 million tonnes more canola. If I then turned the analysis around and said, if the world had not used this technology during that period, and you wanted to produce that extra production conventionally, this slide gives you an indication of the extra land under conventional agriculture that would be required. required. And it relates to the 2018 figures. And what this uh, analysis shows you is that if the world in 2018 had wanted to produce the extra production of those four crops that have been derived from the use of biotechnology, the world would have needed to have planted an extra 24.2 million hectares of those crops to um, in the conventional production. That is equal to nearly 40% of the cropping area in Brazil, to give you some context. In other words, it's quite a significant area. If we move on to pesticide use now, um, as I say, stated earlier, we estimate that the use of pesticides is down by 776 million kilograms less active ingredient used. That's roughly equal to 1.6 times the annual pesticide active ingredient use on crops in China. And, um, and the associated environmental impact as measured by the EIQ indicator is 19%, a larger um, environmental benefits. The largest benefits 
become associated with the use of insect resistant cotton. In greenhouse gas emissions terms, the technology contributes to lowering carbon emissions in two ways, reduced fuel use from less spraying of crops and less soil cultivation. And the herbicide tolerant technology uh, has enabled many farmers to go into, but more importantly, stay in no tillage agriculture. That means less soil preparation or ploughing, which means more storage of soil of carbon in the soil because you're no longer releasing the carbon associated with decaying plant matter um, and the technology has facilitated many farmers going into and staying in it in this form of agriculture and you can see from 2018 we estimate that the technology has resulted in the world reducing its carbon emissions equal to 23 billion kilograms less CO2 emitted. Um, to give you context, that's equivalent to removing 15.3 million cars from the road per year, um, or just under 50% of the cars registered in the United Kingdom as a point of contact. So you could do that calculation for any um, particular country if you have the information. Any negatives associated with the use of the technology? Um, the main one that comes to mind has been the over-reliance on the use of glyphosate by some farmers in North and South America with the herbicide tolerant technology, which has contributed to weed resistance problems developing. As a result, farmers have had to adopt, adapt and change their weed control systems which has led to an increase in herbicide use and higher costs relative to what they were using on these crops 15 years ago. However, it is important to put this in context. Weed resistance problems and increased herbicide use are a trend that has also occurred in conventional crops. And in fact, um, the Herbicide use over the same period on conventional equivalent crops has been similar to, if not higher, than the trend on the herbicide tolerant crops. Um, and the environmental profile of the herbicides used on GM herbicide tolerant crops, even in 2018, remains better than the equivalent on the conventional alternative. And as you will have seen from the continued popularity of the GM herbicide tolerant crops, it remain, they remain more profitable than their conventional alternative. My final conclusion would be that the evidence now after 23 years of widespread use is fairly consistent. It's showing that there are significant socioeconomic and environmental benefits associated with using the technology. Our analysis that I presented to you today uh, simply adds to this literature. I give you the links again there, and I encourage any of you to read these papers and the references cited in them, in them and draw your own conclusions. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Graham Bruce, thank you very much, obviously you've made the point more categorically than I, I, I foresaw about how ag biotechnology has transformed our food systems over the last 30 years or so. Many thanks. Um, we will just move on quickly to the discussion for this particular segment. Mutlasi um, Musi, are you in the room so you could um, begin the discussion on this particular subject? I'm, I'm not seeing Mutlasi in the room here. Um, so then uh, I'll just move on. It's obviously a bit of the conversation that we'll get back to subsequently. So anytime that Musi joins us, then he would help with the discussion on this a bit more. But I'll move on to our second session, uh, which discusses the future possible impacts of biotechnology, ag biotechnology in food system transformation. And the main presenter for this particular topic over the next 10 minutes is Arif Hussain, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Farming Future Bangladesh. Arif, you can go ahead, share your screen, and the next 10 minutes, 
you can go ahead with your presentation. We are listening to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Joseph. I rather thought of going with uh, a conversation rather than showing slide. Um, hi, good evening uh, from Dhaka, Bangladesh, everyone. Uh, this is Arif. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of Farming Future Bangladesh. Farming Future is a comprehensive communication and community engagement organization aimed to improve access to modern agricultural innovations, including application of agri-biotechnology for sustainable food security in Bangladesh. So I think it's a pleasure and privilege for me to be here with you all and talk about the role of uh, ag biotech in transforming food system to increase production and ensuring access to healthier food for sustainable food security. As we all know that the high population growth, limited arable land, climate change, and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has significant impact on food security issues in Bangladesh and in many parts of the world. Achieving sustainable development goals will be more challenging under this situation. According to the Global Food Insecurity Report of 2019, more than 800 million people in the world are still hungry, which makes it more difficult to achieve the zero hunger target by 2030, which is a target mandated in the Sustainable Development Goal. Uh, this is alarming that as number of undernourished people grew due to COVID-19 pandemic, climate change and other conflicting issues, we need to act promptly to have a better solution for all these challenges. Practically the experience that I have gathered uh, being the direct, executive director of Farming Future Bangladesh is very exciting. Uh, in particular, with the issue of application of ag biotech for uh, smallholder farmer, I can tell you the uh, success and the evidence of uh, uh, BT egg plant, which has been approved by the government of Bangladesh back in 2013. And uh, more than 50,000 smallholder farmers are currently uh, cultivated BT egg plant across the country. BT egg plant is the first GM food crop in Asia, South Asia. Uh, which was approved by Bangladesh government back in 2013. Uh, it has been tested, uh, the safety issues have been tested, and now in, in large scale, we have farmers who are growing it, uh, who has proved that BT Bringer and the technology is actually working, and farmers can actually get six-fold increased income from this crop, and they are benefiting from it. And uh, we have a worldwide scientific consensus as we have seen in our previous you know like slide and the discussion that uh, the safety and the you know like benefit of gm crops development and using the tool of biotechnology has been agreed by everyone in the world particularly the expert and scientist the socioeconomic benefit uh, in last 23 years as we have seen in our previous uh, discussion that uh, for increased productivity or food self sufficiency or even con 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 conversation or conserving the biodiversity. All these things are actually much more easier now if we can uh, use the tool, agribiotech tool, uh, for you know, like improving economic health and social benefit for farmer and smallholder farmer. And as we have seen that uh, in last two decades, uh, 71 countries have adopted biotech crops, 29 countries have planted crops and 42 additional countries actually imported biotech crops. So what do we need to do in future? We all know that, you know, like the food safety and food security is a constant challenge for many parts of the world, for many people of the world. As I mentioned earlier that 800 people are actually sleeping without any food with empty stomach. So we need a better solution for all of them. We need to share the evidence-based information about social, economic, and environmental benefits of modern agricultural innovation, tools like ag biotech, CRISPR, generating everything. We have seen that how a farmer with a better technology can save their crop, like the papaya or cassava, or even eggplant. We've seen that how in large scale, the production of Bt cotton helped countries to uh, become uh, exporter from an importing country. In case of India, we have seen that how significantly they have improved the production of cotton. 
So there are many good evidence and example across the country, across different world uh, economical systems. And uh, uh, we, we need to look into the, like the system in, in, in a critical way now, because you know, like the nutritional content and the beneficial element of, from, of, of, of staple foods, such as you know, like rice enriched with vitamin and mineral need to be emphasized and uh, allowed to be grown so that smallholder farmer can have access to that. We need to take immediate action and create an enabling environment for ag biotech to help countries like Bangladesh, because we have 160 million people and we need to feed them with only 8 million hectares of arable land. We need to produce crop and food for farmers and consumers, and we need to create access to safer, healthier nutrition food. We have to help people to understand the importance of modern innovative tools like ag biotech. And we have to allow them to accept the technology as means of enhancing food security, improving environmental sustainability, and raising the quality of life. So I think this is time, high time for us all to come forward and promote and allow people to innovate and work more to use this technology for, you know, like food security and sustainability. Thank you. Arif, thank you very much. Uh, those are very um, interesting thoughts there on what the future possible impacts of ag biotechnology in food system transformation will be going forward. Um, I can see a number of questions have started coming up in the chat. We'll get to them in the final 30 minutes or so of the discussion. So uh, we can all just be patient and get to them in a while. But um, on this particular session that Arif just presented on, We'll get on to our first discussion for that particular section with Tumbiko Chinoko, who is the project manager of the Open Forum on Agricultural Biotechnology in Kenya. Vitu, you have five minutes uh, to discuss the future possible impacts of our biotechnology in food system transformation. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator and the um, all participants. I'm really happy to, to be here and the uh, when Arif was presenting, I could um, agree with most of your points. And that is a very difficult position to be a discussant and you agree with the present on everything. Uh, but it just shows uh, that our spirits are connected on this issue. Um, and I want to agree that uh, one, I think uh, there's a tremendous role of agriculture about technology in the future of agriculture. Uh, I, there's quite a lot that is happening that has been impeding agriculture where agriculture by technology can be a solution. Um, I think one of the things that I want to highlight, the first one is the, the role of agriculture by technology and value addition. Uh, and if we're talking about Africa where we are looking at uh, mass production uh, and then these crops uh, uh, are usually just exported as they are, I think there's quite a lot that agriculture by technology can play in terms of what else can we do uh, with the crops that we're producing to ensure that we get um, uh, the best out of what we're producing. So even when those crops are not uh, biotech products, but I think agriculture by technology can play a role uh, in terms of really adding value to uh, the production line to ensure that we get the best and we get the maximum from, uh, from our production. So that's, that's something that scientists need to look at, and I think they're already looking at, uh, but there is a lot of potential in that respect. Uh, the other thing that I also want to really look at and maybe uh, focus on is the fact that, uh, um, one, we've seen how, uh, from the figures that uh, Brooks mentioned and also Arif talked about, how uh, agriculture biotechnology continues to reduce uh, the level of effort that farmers are applying on the field. And that has a lot of uh, implications at household level in terms of one, uh, allowing farmers to be able to do other things because now they are spending less time on the farm. Uh, that means for most of us in Africa, we'll not be taking our children to the farm. Uh, we'll, be, we'll allow our children to go back to school to read their books. And that has actually a very huge implication when it comes to raising uh, the standards at household level. But I also want to think that when a country produces more, there is actually a lot that you can you, you start now to think about what you want what you want to do with your produce. The reason why we are not also innovative enough about what we want to do with our production is because we are producing very little. 
So the little that we are producing is just enough for food. And in many cases, it's not even enough for food. So even when you start thinking about what should we do more to our crops, we, we can't even start to engage the brain in that respect because we're producing very little. Now, here's the where agriculture biotechnology can play a role. We increase production. We start thinking, this maize that I've produced, I think there's more that I can do to eat than just to uh, um, uh, have food. You know, so I would think that in the wrong land, there's quite a lot of industrialization related implications that would come with increased production that come with agriculture biotechnology. Uh, yesterday, uh, no, last this week, basically, I was meeting with the ACARO, uh, which is the Kenya Agriculture Research Institution. And in there, I was introduced to one innovation. And I was very pleased with that innovation because I come from Africa, which is one region which is um, uh, man malnourished. Uh, and we've been getting calls from the antis that one of the things that Africa needs to stop is eating meat. And I'm like, which kind of meat? We, we already, I mean, we don't have enough meat, but they're saying it is causing climate change and therefore we need to stop eating. Uh, I come from a climate change background, so I, I totally understand the scientific side of methane, um, and, and maybe those calls come from there. But the point I'm trying to say is that uh, at Caro, they are actually working on a biotech product that one, uh, if, if it is approved, is going to reduce the production of methane by 30%, you know? And at the same time, it is going to increase milk production by 40%. And this is about a crop. This is about a product that they're working on. Now, I'm just looking at the potential that that would have one in terms of the problem of climate change, but also how if we continue to eat meat, it is going to uh, continue to uh, reduce issues of malnutrition and all that. And that's an area that we need to explore in terms of how else can we, for example, from the biotech angle, uh, try to uh, contain the problem of climate change? And it is there. Most of agriculture biotech research in Africa and most of the developing countries is not supported by government. And I think going forward, one of the things that I look at in terms of the future is that government is going to integrate agriculture about technology into its ways of doing things. So it is something that they can budget for. It is something that they can plan in terms of training their own scientists. It is something that they will be concerned and if the development around agriculture biotechnology is going down. As I'm speaking today, uh, within the Malabo framework, which is the African vision on agriculture, agriculture biotechnology is not monitored. So nobody is, is, is concerned about what, how we're doing in agriculture biotechnology. We can monitor about trade, we can monitor about everything else, but agriculture biotechnology is not monitored. It is because we're not investing in it. So if you talk, if you ask me about the future, I'm looking at a future where we're able to invest our own money as African governments, as developing countries into research around agriculture biotechnology uh, so that we own the agenda and the agenda becomes part and parcel of our development framework. So I would want to end my presentation there in terms of how I look at the future uh, and I've touched on the, the practical uh, uh, aspects, but also in terms of the policy and how I envision government owning up the agenda around agriculture biotechnology. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Great to thank you very much. Very insightful, particularly from the African perspective when it comes to the possible future impact of ag biotechnology in food system transformation. Let's get the perspective from Latin America as well. Andre Toma Vilela Herman is the founder of Synthetic Biologic Club in Brazil. Um, you have the next five minutes as well, even as you conclude the conversation on this and move on to the gene editing part of the conversation. Andrew. All right. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, I will share a presentation here. Uh, so Brazil uh, is a, a country that has uh, some while now. And it's interesting to observe that uh, adopting the technologies, the, the new forms of, of 
of agriculture. Uh, we moved from a uh, uh, food importing country to uh, exporting food country. And there are many technologies uh, coming into place. Uh, we, we, most of the technology that uh, are being uh, introduced into uh, biotechnology, they are uh, transformations uh, using plasmids. BT technology comes from that. Uh, if you see insect resistance and herbicide, herbicide uh, tolerance, uh, most of the technology uh, is from a recombinant uh, plasmid DNA. And now we are also having some some crops that are being developed uh, with gene editing. It's a different technology uh, that we mm-hmm. use CRISPR. And many countries are developing uh, new mm-hmm. new varieties, uh, new kind of technologies to help farmers in the field. Um, we see that the RNA that uh, we we had in in some technologies like in the papaya from Hawaii to, to fight the viruses, uh, we saw also being applied in other crops. Uh, the the same uh, molecule that RNA uh, represents are also being uh, used to 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 develop vaccines. It's not the same technology, but it's a it's, Kind of similar that we uh, use uh, messenger RNA to to develop some of the COVID vaccines uh, that we faced in this last year. And as I I, I talked about the the papaya industry in Hawaii uh, has. Uh, was improved a lot uh, of the production. They had suffered from the uh, the ring spot virus uh, in the 90s. The the, the production of, of papayas in the Hawaii has decreased. Uh, but since they started uh, adopting the technology, the GMO papaya, the production has increased again and. Uh, Many people say that the the GMO has helped uh, to save the industry there. In Brazil, uh, RNA has been developed in GMO beans. Uh, There is a commercial variety already that is resistant to the golden mosaic virus um, and uh, is being sold here in Brazil. So it's it's not only uh, big crops, but also small crops that people that our researchers are uh, uh, trying to to build new varieties, trying to to find uh, uh, new solutions to farmers. And in Africa, there is the 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 cowpea resistant to pod barrier. Uh, that is now being uh, released in some countries, and it's 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 a sustainable solution because you you can improve your your plant. You, in the case of Bt, you have proteins being produced inside the 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 plants, uh, and you don't need to to spray insecticides. And this can can help. Uh, to fight the past without uh, uh, altering the ecosystem as well. So you, you have different kinds of organisms that would be in your crop that wouldn't be affected uh, directly. Uh, there are new technologies being developed. Uh, it's important to, to, to say that when we are talking about biology, you learn from different uh, different parts, uh, different organisms. In the case of virus, uh, people sometimes have a, a bad view about viruses, but 
there are new technologies being developed from virus. Uh, in this study, for example, uh, they they used some some parts uh, to understand and develop new new varieties. So it's a it's a cycle. Uh, you you have problems. You design a solution. You build new varieties. You test them. You have policymakers that are uh, trying to 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 test in the field uh, these new varieties, and you you learn, and then you you repeat the cycle and build new opportunities, build uh, new technologies for uh, solving many problems. These are some references, um, and if anyone would like to chat about any of the, the, the things that I presented here today, uh, I would gladly uh, be available. You can find me on social media or talk with the Cornell Alliance for Science. They have my contact. Thank you. Andre, thank you very much. Um, very interesting thoughts there from the Southern American perspective when it comes to the future possible impacts of ag biotechnology in food system transformation. We are still here at the Cornell Alliance for Science uh, UN Global Food System Summit 2021 Independent Dialogue. Um, it's on the role of agricultural biotechnology in food systems transformation. We've been having a conversation on the role that um, ag biotechnology specifically has played in helping expand on food systems over the last few years and what the future possible impact will be. Uh, but again, speaking of the future, we're getting into the final leg of the conversation and then we would open up the room and get responses to the questions that have come through. Uh, and this segment is a conversation on the future possible impacts of gene editing in food system transformation. And John Comin, who is founder of the Comin Bioscience Consultancy in the Netherlands, is our main presenter for this section. And um, he has the next 10 minutes to then go ahead with it. John, you can go ahead, check slide, and the next 10 minutes you are in your hands. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph, and thanks to you and the Alliance for Science for the, the invite to this actually very timely um, dialogue. And um, so I hope you can see my screen okay. If not, I'll proceed until you start protesting. So yeah, the timeliness, it's been a good week, uh, guys. We're, it's Friday afternoon here. It's been a very good week. Uh, we saw articles in the New York Times uh, of all places where uh, a, a much more upbeat and positive story was uh, provided on genetically modified organisms. This was followed, well, at least in my inbox, uh, with a story uh, by uh, an analysis by the uh, Heartland Institute, which actually touches on the one of the themes uh, of today. Um, in the, uh, the lead up to the UN uh, Food Systems Summit, we have to emphasize, as Graham Brooks did earlier in this, uh, in this seminar, in this di dialogue, that the option of genetically engineered crops is essential to, uh, to reach not only higher productivity, but also to uh, uh, move towards lower carbon emi uh, emitting agriculture. This doesn't only apply to the uh, uh, plant production, of course, but uh, very much so to animal production. In the area where, where I work most of the times in Africa, unhealthy, low productivity um, uh, livestock is uh, contributing uh, disproportionately to greenhouse gas emissions in, in those economies. So we have to uh, keep livestock applications in mind as well. So we're still on the on the biotech GMO uh, question, but as of uh, today, uh, I think uh, social media uh, exploded <laughs> almost when uh, the story uh, broke that the um, Bureau of Plant Industry in the Philippines uh, issued a biosafety permit for the commercial propagation of golden rice. So while this is still on the on the GMO topic. I think it logically uh, introduces the uh, the next topic, and we'll be discussing the future possible impacts of gene editing in food systems transformation. And uh, well, actually, it's you know I'm I'm going to take you back to the future because a couple of products are already out there. Uh, 
Cebus, Calyx have already uh, launched gene edited products that are not regulated as GMOs, but as uh, uh, well, almost as conventional products. And that is uh, uh, important to, uh, to realize as we start this part of the conversation. We're not talking about pie in the sky applications. The first products are out there and uh, it's driving a, uh, a very dynamic and uh, very diverse uh, R&D pipeline in many different countries. My name is John Coleman. Uh, I'm an independent advisor, uh, primarily working with the program for biosafety systems in Sub-Sahara Africa, but I've uh, also worked in other parts of the world, including Southeast and South Asia, as well as South and uh, Central America. So yeah, this um, topic of gene editing is uh, attracting a lot of attention for good reasons. Uh, because there's a, uh, a growing range of applications that focuses at crops and traits that have been historically almost impossible uh, to tackle. So this is an example in Kenya where uh, field experiments are ongoing for striga resistant sorghum, a drought tolerant crop. It's a farmer's prefer preferred crop. It's grown predominantly by small farmers who are uh, who stand to lose most from uh, changes in uh, global uh, climate. And that's why it's so significant that a Kenyan professor is leading this, um, this project together with local public research institutes as well as the international private sector. So this already provides us a, a look into the future of genome editing and what it will mean to plant production in a country like Kenya and in East and West Africa and Southern Africa uh, generally. So that brings me to a couple of topics I would like to uh, touch on or actually skim over in the uh, next couple of minutes. Mr. Chairman, I will be pointing to uh, the very rapidly evolving international context for genome editing in agriculture research, touching on the global R&D landscape, the regulatory developments worldwide, and then uh, touch on the relevance of all this to the upcoming UN Food Systems Summit, uh, which is recognizing the need for science, technology, and innovation, and the diversity that has to be promoted in, in innovation in order to, uh, um, to tackle food systems reform that leads to more productive and more sustainable food systems. And I will try to conclude with a couple of policy considerations for discussion. So as previous um, discussions have already indicated, we're now seeing this, uh, um, this extension of the toolbox for precision plant breeding from transgenic approaches or cisgenic and intragenic uh, approaches when the same gene pool is used to genome editing, where in most cases, no promoter or terminator gene has to be transferred, but actually leads to very pre precise point edits in a plant genome. And this is important to understand that, you know, it's an extension of a, an existing toolbox, which in itself is an extension of uh, uh, the toolbox we already used for many, many decades, if not centuries in conventional breeding, mutation breeding and what have you. So it's an extension of technologies and toolboxes that keep evolving over time. Of course, the beauty of this is that with these precise genome edits, no foreign DNA, no recombinant DNA, it's transferred into the organism. And therefore, most applications that are uh, approaching the market uh, these days are not considered GMOs in the more traditional sense of the, of the word. So that's a very significant policy and regulatory uh, consideration here. So what we see in the last previous, uh, last couple of years, and unfortunately this analysis I'm citing by Mens and other uh, authors um, stopped somewhat uh, halfway 2019 in order to get published in uh, 2020 last year. But what you see is this trend in the application of uh, CRISPR in plant breeding. Uh, this is not just uh, um, lab experiments that the authors have looked at. These are actual studies 
which have gone beyond proof of concept and are called market-oriented genome editing applications in crop and in ornamental plants in uh, over the last 15 years. And uh, so what we can all see is the quick rise in the number of applications of uh, CRISPR technology in plant improvement. What we see here is uh, not just a, a rapid increase in, in one particular category of applications, but that CRISPR and other genome editing tools are looking at very different qualities and very different traits as compared to the, the GM biotechnology revolution, which focused so far mostly on uh, developing herbicide tolerant and insect tolerant crops. So what we, what we see here, from this same study by Mensenal is a heavy emphasis on improving agronomic value of crops, including yield potential, food and feed quality, biotic stress uh, tolerance, and only followed in the fourth place by, by herbicide tolerance. So a much more diverse picture and very different from uh, the GM debate. And that's also, once again, why these applications are looking into uh, problems that have so far been intractable in uh, very difficult uh, crops for plant breeders, looking at uh, 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 fungal diseases in banana, for example, uh, black stika toga and other fungal diseases that uh, can wipe out banana crops uh, um, as we know it. And, uh, Nowadays, there's a very uh, wide range of uh, projects aiming at developing much more resistant bananas for uh, tropical agroecologies. So this potential has not only um, led to um, a rapid increase in, in CRISPR and other applications in, uh, in public organizations and universities or in the developing world, in the, um, this is a, an example from, uh, from North America. There's a very wide range of, um, of startup companies, so to speak, technology startups, dedicated technology firms, developing technologies uh, related to plant and animal genome editing, working with uh, uh, public sector organizations around the globe, and also with the, the large international private sector in developing uh, the first products that have uh, hit the market. So also here we see a much wider diversity of actors also in the private sector as compared to uh, the GM debate. We will not have time today to look at the regulatory developments and regulatory uh, context around the globe. I will be touching on this in one or two case studies later on. Uh, suffice it to say that also from a regulatory point of view, the world is changing rapidly. If you're looking for an, uh, um, an up-to-date resource, I would uh, suggest you visit this, uh, this website maintained by the, um, uh, the G Genetic Literacy Project, or GLP, which has a, a current overview of regulatory developments with regard to genome editing around the world. But uh, this actually allows me to transit very nicely to uh, the UN Food Systems Summit, which actually, and, and almost uh, to my surprise, has a very um, yeah, central theme of um, dealing with the role of science, technology, and innovation for transforming food systems globally. And uh, one of the, uh, the first and uh, most important uh, background, background briefs that was uh, developed uh, uh, by the uh, Inter-Academy Partnership emphasizes this important role of science and technology in transforming food systems, uh, which also somewhat in passing uh, recognizes the, um, uh, the potential of genome editing, but uh, especially looks at the, uh, the delay that has to be reduced in translating all of these devolving research outputs into innovation and policy reforms and, and regulatory developments. And I think that is important that this is recognized uh, in the, uh, the lead towards the, uh, the UN Food Systems Summit. And I think we as a, as a group here and in our network should also ensure that this message is, uh, is heard loudly. 
Now, if we look at the practical example here, I think um, many of us are familiar with the uh, example from, from Argentina, which is actually uh, very successfully translated uh, research into innovations and into policy reforms when it comes to genome editing. I will not go into too much detail, but just suffice to say that by providing an enabling environment to uh, innovation in the country, what we see in Argentina is from a very narrow basis in the biotech GMO uh, uh, picture, they are now have evolved into many a wider diversity of uh, novel traits that I looked into uh, using novel plant breeding, new breeding techniques leading to what they have determined in Argentina to non-GMO products uh, through the application of genome editing. A wide diversity of traits is being looked at uh, involving a wide diversity in the biological kingdom, plants, animals, as well as microorganisms. So you can see the contrast with the, uh, the previous phase in plant biotechnology. So also if we look at the Argentina case study and how um, the actives are much more diverse compared to, uh, to the, the GM crop uh, debate is that if we look to at the application of new novel breeding techniques in uh, plant and animal and microorganism development, we see a lead role for um, for local companies, small and medium-sized enterprises, local public enterprises or, or research institutes, and there's much smaller role for the international private sector in technology development in a country like Argentina. So that already points to the fact that compared to genetic modification applications, this whole research sector has become so much more attractive to smaller, private and, uh, and public organizations to invest in. And so why is that? And I, I strongly feel in this case, it's the government policy and regulatory environment in Argentina that has played a uh, essential role here. Argentina, and once again, we'll not go into too much detail uh, today, but we can do it at a later stage. Argentina has um, uh, implemented a, um, a very short and straightforward consultation process through which the regulatory authorities and an applicant can determine whether a specific application falls within GMO regulation or not. If not, it's, uh, it's passed on to other regulatory authorities because we all know uh, agriculture and uh, variety development and uh, new livestock developments are heavily regulated not just from a biosafety point of view. If it is determined as a GMO, uh, to be a GMO, it enters the, the regular biosafety review and decision-making process. But this consultation step has worked out extremely well in diversifying innovations uh, in uh, Argentina in genome editing. And that's also why a country like Kenya is also looking at, at options to uh, uh, promote local innovation, in genome editing. Already the National Biosafety Authority has uh, reviewed a number of contained use laboratory experiments uh, involving genome editing using its current GMO regulatory framework. It's important to note here that it also involves livestock applications like a swine fever vaccine or resistance to trypanosomiasis in goats. And you can also see from the range of crops that are involved here is that it's not just maize and the other big staple crops that are involved, but this um, has potential to a range of uh, what we usually call orphan crops, sorghum, grass pea, yam, cassava, and so on and so forth that uh, have received little uh, R&D attention so far. What's interesting in Kenya is that uh, even the Biosafety Authority recognized that uh, it's uh, considering applications that do not involve GMOs since no recombinant DNA is, um, is produced or transferred to, uh, to a new, uh, to a new uh, event. And so therefore they have set in motion a, um, the development, a process to develop a guideline 
that deals with uh, genome editing applications. Uh, very much following the example uh, set by Argentina and other South American countries, uh, as well as other countries on the globe, where there's no foreign DNA involved, uh, a much shorter review process uh, can be set in motion. So this is how governments introduce policy reforms, once again, to uh, encourage innovation and to diversify innovation in the local public sector, the local private sector, as well as the international public and private sector. So let me sum up here then, uh, Joseph, uh, by once again pointing to this very rapidly evolving global context in terms of research and development, as well as regulatory policy. There's a a wide diversity in innovators, in traits that are looked at, plants, animals, microorganisms uh, are being improved using genome editing, not just for uh, scientific interests, but with a new product and a relevant product in mind. Countries that uh, encourage this type of innovation have are adopting case-by-case -case consultation approaches to determine whether a new product and application falls inside or outside of the GMO oversight. And they use a defined set of information that government authorities can use to make this determination in fixed timelines, be it 15 days or 30 days or sometimes even less. What's also important and which I haven't touched on uh, uh, in detail is this emerging South-South collaboration and sub-regional harmonization around genome editing. Uh, South America provides a very good example where countries such as Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and many others are converging around a common set of principles as, how regulatory, as to how regulatory authorities uh, deal with genome editing applications. And at the national level, the time, is to, uh, the time to act is now. It's important that the various agencies responsible for environmental, food and feed safety, for agriculture development and variety registration get together, uh, sort out the, uh, the way they coordinate around these new technologies and make sure they come up with uh, enabling policies and guidelines, as well as a program for capacity development in this area. And with that, I would like to uh, stop for, for now and hand it over back to you, Mr. Facilitator. Thank you very much. John Comin, thank you very much. Very, very um, insightful uh, points there that you make. Um, just to quickly hear from our discussant for this section and then we'll open the room and have a general conversation. Uh, Dr. Navneet Kaur, who is um, an Indian scientist and a postdoc research scientist at the uh, Rothamsted Research in the UK. Uh, the platform is yours for the next five minutes uh, on the future possible impacts of gene editing in food system transformation. Navneet, take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. As Joseph introduced, I'm Navneet and I'm working at Rothamsted Research and my field, I work in genome editing area. Mm -hmm. So considering the ever growing population worldwide, we need advanced technologies to provide nutritious food worldwide. And for that, we need advanced biotechnology tools. And especially as there is an issue with the transgene system, we need like transgene free, transgenic, uh, transgene -free technology. So genome editing is one of that tool which can provide us transgene free uh, breeding like that's why it's called precise breeding technology so i would be covering like how genome editing can provide sustainability in agriculture approach so in developing countries crops is we by genome editing we can provide herbicide resistant crops uh, for that, because there is no requirement of uh, introducing any transgen into the crops but we can but uh, we can introduce uh, these small mutation into particular genes and provide herbicide resistance to the plants. And second thing is in the plants, they uh, in itself, they have some genes which can provide them uh, resistant to many biotic and abiotic stresses, but they, those genes are kind of negative regulators. So when they are present there, the uh, plants cannot survive such condition, but uh, by genome editing, we can add it or remove those genes. And one of the example is rice where fungal blast resistance has been developed in rice and uh, by genome editing. And, uh, 
it's been available so and further the very easy option is kind of like domestication of the wild type crops so in like modern crops if we consider they have been selectively inbred and to develop and get some particular important characteristics in the crops like their height uh, the fruit quality the nutrition value but during this process we have lost some characteristics which were actually providing those plants uh, resilience to the biotic and uh, abiotic stress considering the tomato there is one example like we have selectively bred tomato lines but in the end right, right now the present tomato varieties are they have good quality they have good self Fly, but they are still sensitive to many abiotic and biotic stresses. But uh, the wild type available, the tomato varieties, they have like quite resilience to these abiotic and biotic stress. So since now, the considering the genome sequences available and the biological and genetic studies done on the genes, we can simply domesticate those genes in the wild type varieties. And this has already been done by two groups in case of tomato. And this can provide sustainability in agriculture. And there are so many examples I can go on. But yes, it, with rapidly developing this CRISPR technology, there is uh, like huge scope for sustainability in agriculture but i think it requires like to adopt this uh, genome editing worldwide uh, we need huge support from the government to develop or like make good regulatory system also considering the like having a reasonable discussion with the public thank you lovely thank you very much straight to the point uh, uh, very insightful thoughts there uh, many thanks for taking the time of your busy schedule to join us for this conversation. Um, I'll get on to our final discussant for this particular uh, section, and then we'll spend the last few minutes having a general discussion. Daniel Nerero, um, he's uh, the founder of um, the New Crop Group in Chile, um, also discussing the subject having to do with future possible impacts of gene editing when it comes to food system transformation. Daniel, over to you, the next five minutes. Thank you, Josep. Uh, well, I want to comment that uh, South America has established its, itself as the world biotech granary uh, with the largest production and export of GMOs, uh, undoubtedly facilitated by regulations that have allowed. In the case of uh, new gene editing techniques, it seems that we are also going to be the next research and production in the center. Uh, Argentina was the first country in the world to regulate the use of new breed techniques in 2015. And we follow with Chile in 2017, and later Brazil, Colombia, Paraguay, and Uruguay join us, while other countries on the continent uh, discuss possible regulatory approvals. Um, but what is the key difference that I see between the first wave of GMOs and the new stage with gene editing? To understand this, uh, we must remember that GMOs uh, were initially promoted by large companies in developed countries uh, because uh, they have the financial backing to embark on a long research journey and a heavy regulatory burden. Naturally, uh, they invest in large area crops and in general problems of several countries, uh, which will allow them to recoup the investment in the long term. Uh, however, with the new generating technologies, much more precise, uh, cheaper, and with a much simpler regulation, uh, developing countries have the golden opportunity uh, that that this time the public entities and national companies develop new crops for our national realities in order to face in, in a better way the problem of small farmers and the climate change of the century. Uh, success histories uh, with local GMOs uh, like the BT eggplant in Bangladesh, the GM papaya in Hawaii, or the most recent GM bean in Brazil uh, can multiply by, by dozens on every continent throughout this decade thanks to gene editing. Of course, uh, as long as countries adopt simplified regulatory approaches and prevent their scientists' innovations from getting stuck in a request in a regulatory office. And uh, the South American case so far is an example to follow by avoiding to equating this technology with GMOs as the Europeans have unfortunately done. In several uh, Latin American countries, there are very important crops such as cassava, banana, rice, uh, beans, which face serious pests and diseases, and gene editing can offer, in many cases, the only efficient and sustainable control method. Uh, 
the large companies from North America or Europe uh, are not going to come to invest in these crops, but we need local public actors to do so. Uh, other example is the, the large cattle raising countries of the um, Southern Con can also use this technology to obtain specimens that metabolize faster, more efficiently, and produce uh, more meat as well, a lower methane emission. In the case of Chile, uh, my country, uh, the last decade we faced the worst drought in our history. Uh, many farmers and ranchers lost everything due to the lack of rainfall, and desertification is progressing more and more throughout the country. Politicians talk a lot about different tools to deal with this problem, but generally uh, all, uh, have no idea of the importance of precision breeding to adapt our crops to a more uh, in, in a more uh, to, to the climate. Uh, so far, there are public institutions, uh, universities, and a very few startups in, in Chile, in Argentina, Brazil, and Colombia, developing genetic, genetic crops to, seek, uh, to contribute to a more productive and sustainable agriculture. I hope uh, new neighbors doing soon. Uh, another important point with this technology is to get a better nutrition. An example in my country is the high consumption of bread and pasta. We are among the largest consumers in the world. But at the same time, the population has high rates of obesity, overweight, and also a very low consumption of fiber, which has a lot of health benefits and helps with, with control, by the way. For this reason, at Neocrop, uh, and a startup that I co-founded, we work on a genetic platform, uh, which has been validated with a prototype of local high fiber wheat. Uh, we believe that increasing fiber in, in, in a high consumption of food is a pragmatic and viable solution to a natural health problem. And CRISPR allows us to put the breeding time in half and modify a very complex genome for conventional tools. And finally, as a general message, I hope that our friends in Africa and, and Asia follow a path close to the South American one with a simple regulation that do not hinder the innovation of their own scientists. Let's avoid ro uh, roads like the European one, which despite having so much wealth, uh, potential and technological capabilities, have not allowed their farmers to benefit from genetic engineering for more than 20 years. And that's my, my comment about the genetic in, in the Latin American context. Thank you. Dalia, thank you very much. And I like how you brought the Latin American perspective to the entire conversation. Um, it makes uh, for a great global conversation because then that's the idea that we would want to hear from uh, different parts of the world in terms of other perspectives. Uh, we have the next 15 minutes that we are dedicating to um, q and I've seen a number of questions in the chat, but before we get to there, um, Slavia Tiria will be doing a quick report, a three-minute report, highlighting the key issues that have come up over the last one hour, 15 minutes or so in our conversation, and then we get on to the Q&A section of it. Slavia, uh, the next three minutes, and then we'll take it up from there. Thank you, Joseph. Um, we've had an interesting one hour and almost 10 minutes listening to some of the impact of biotech in our world from various people representing um, the, con the continent. And it's been an interesting one hearing that um, biotech has helped improve um, food and is helping to reduce the hunger crisis on the continent and then the world at large. And with what the UN food system is looking at, seeing to it that no one is left behind, then biotech, as our panelists have said, is one of the ways of seeing to it that no individual is left behind in this conversation. They've raised um, interesting things up, which is um, biotech has helped increase the income of farmers to about 225 billion um, if we are to get involved in or use biotech then for africa we'll be able to um, increase um, crop yield which will lead to industrialization like for our continent like africa we are unable to have this conversation about industrialization because in terms of crop yield, it is low and people are unable to feed themselves. And as Harry said, we have about 800 million of people going to bed hungry. And into the future, one of the, some of the ways we can improve our food system, which has been suggested by our panelists, is to involve the public in this discussion. We should be able to create an enabling environment for, for innovators. And we should also be able to 
initiate um, programs for capacity development. If you want a world where no one is left behind, if you want a world where there's enough to feed all of us, then we need to adapt biotech, which has been suggested by our panelists. Thank you, Joe. You can take over. Claudia, thank you very much for that very quick report on what has come up thus far. Uh, we have about 13 minutes or so to then deal with some of the questions that have come up and then to help with um, some further conversation on this. Um, a number of the questions, let me just run you through them in a while. Uh, Mofi Koch has a question. Uh, he makes the point, interesting presentation uh, in reference to Dr. Graham Brook's question. So Dr. Brook, this question is for you. Um, uh, Mofi is asking, how can these socioeconomic benefits of GM crops be included in the climate change and agricultural sustainability talks? Um, Dr. Bruce, if, if, if we can deal with that in the next minute or two, so that then we move on to all the several other questions in there. Yes, um, I, I think it's very important that the impacts that work like mine, not only mine, shows is the consistency of the impacts of the technology and how it contributes to, in a sustainable agricultural future and makes positive contributions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's too much narrative, especially from developed countries, notably the European Union, that in order to move towards reducing carbon emissions, we need to de-intensify agriculture. That is an oversimplification, because if you wish to save the land with the highest biodiversity, like tropical rainforests, you need to reduce the pressure to bring that high biodiversity land into other uses like agriculture. If you can feed the world through existing land that's in agriculture, using the available technology of which crop biotech is an important one and you marry it with some of the best production methods from uh, all forms of agriculture even organic types of production that is the way that the world should be looking to feed the world in a, as sustainable a way in the future and secondly the and the information that uh, comes out of work like ours is the tremendous farm income or socioeconomic benefits that many farmers get from using the technology, especially in developing right. countries. Because it is key to also remember that you can't really have environmental sustainability without a degree of economic sustainability. In other words, if you want people in agriculture to adopt and maintain the most sustainable practices for the environment, they need to be able to make a living out of very, it. Very, well. very insightful points there, Dr. Bruce. Um, there was another question from Mufi about uh, how these conversations and the points about the benefits of GM crops can be part of the food system summit generally. And we, we are working on that. All this will be part of the report that we'll put together and. Uh, and report back to the gateway dialogue so that then hopefully these conversations around gene editing and GM crops feed into that broader conversation generally. But uh, John Comin, there's another question for you. Um, John Comin touched on the fact that gene editing crops, gene edited crops that do not trigger GM regulation are still regulated. That's our food. How do we remind consumers that while not regulated as GM crops, food products of gene edited crops are still regulated as foods in all countries? Um, John, if you can touch on that in a minute, maximum two minutes, I'll be grateful. So we move on to the other question. Yeah, it's 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 more of a comment than a yeah, than a question, really. Um, you know, our food, our agricultural inputs, our agricultural outputs have never been as heavily regulated as they are uh, in the 21st century, our food has never been safer. And that doesn't only apply to um, uh, 
uh, genetically modified food that have an extra dimension of, uh, of regulation before they reach the market, but also for any food that hits our uh, food stalls or supermarkets or, or mini markets. And, and that's often forgotten in the debate uh, regarding genome editing. When a regulatory authority, such as a national biosafety authority, determines an application or a product as being non-GM or not a GMO for very good scientific reasons, that doesn't mean that all other <laughs> regulatory uh, processes are not applicable as well. So uh, in most jurisdictions, this technology would still have to go through, in the case of plants, um, uh, conventional, well, conventional to uh, common variety testing uh, schemes. Uh, it will have to go through food and feed safety assessments under public health or a uh, an autonomous food authority, and so on and so forth. There may even be different uh, environmental regulations for environmental impact assessments that might affect the, uh, the actual uh, research and development process. So when we say GMO regulations do not apply, that doesn't mean that um, all other regulations that we have in the world these days uh, would not apply. Okay. So um, yeah, I hope that, that that message is not overlooked in, uh, in these discussions. Uh, maybe other panelists would like to uh, chip in as well. Very important point there, um, to, to a certain extent, to a very large extent, you, you've addressed that. And I think it goes back to the point that one way or the other, we need to keep reminding people of that so that then um, that impression doesn't get stuck in the minds of people that generated crops will probably not face any kind of regulation at all. So sensitization, having the conversation going, obviously, are key elements if, if we can ensure that. Um, but Daniel, there's a question for you. It's exciting to see small companies apply gene editing to locally important crops? How do we support these innovators and public sector scientists to move innovations from the lab to the farmers? And um, in, in asking this question, Mufi makes the point that in my experience, this delivery is often a stumbling block. So from your own experience working uh, with new crop, Daniel, how do we move the research from the lab to the fields? Again, in just a minute or two, so that then I can move on to other panelists, Daniel. Uh, Joseph, excuse me, I, I had a problem here with some uh, workers in the house. Uh, can you repeat the, the, the question? I, I know it was long, but I, did, I didn't hear. Sure. So, so in summary, how do we move research work that has been done in the lab, from the lab to the field, um, especially for small firms like yours and other startups world over? Uh, keep it within a minute or two, please. Oh, uh, well, the, the, to to uh, to have a, a crop from the lab to the to the market in our countries is uh, it's a kind of difficult for GMOs, but in general, uh, we, we need to apply to public public funds. There is a well, it depends of the country. Uh, there is a lot of funds that you can use to, to initiate your your startup. For example, here in Latin America. But it's very important, I think, to associate with with a small farm, with a small companies of farm, you know, with a union of farmers, with a, a small or medium company of agriculture that are interested in, in, in improve their seeds. So in, you have those um, approaches to to get some resources uh, in order to take the, the crop from the lab into the, the 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 fields and finally to the regulation process on the market. It's not easy, but there is a lot of uh, ways to do that. Very well, very well. Uh, we have just about um, five minutes to round up because then it's almost 30 p.m. GMT. Uh, but just to run through this very quickly, um, I think there's a question that V2 can help us answer. Uh, or maybe Arif Hussein of Farming Future Bangladesh. Uh, Pablo makes the point that our current food systems can produce more food without using more land or more harmful inputs to meet the 2030 SDGs. The US presenters have covered how genetic engineering technologies and new innovative plant breeding techniques can help us get there faster. Uh, and then he goes on to make the point, but since we only have 10 more harvests to achieve the SDGs, 
um, he, he's asking, what is the most important action that we need to take to make sure that research on this technology gets translated to the benefit of our food systems? Um, uh, how do we move beyond just the research and ensure that the positive outcomes of ag biotech crops actually get to the ordinary people? I, I would really love to hear a very brief comment from um, Arif Hussein um, and, and Vitu as well of Ofabon that Arif, if, if we can do that within a minute or a minute and a half, then we hear from Vitu and then we could probably bring that conversation to a close. So I will actually uh, summarize it in, in a way that we have two different parts of any egg biotech, uh, you know, like a uh, product. One is biotech uh, product development and research, and the other part is policy and regulation. So what happens in case of biotech and GMO is that policy and regulations has become much more critical uh, in contrast to developing the product. It, it seems that the policy and regulations are more important rather than getting the product uh, to the actual beneficiaries. So we need to think critically now that uh, in which direction we need to move in because all the like enabling condition or you know, like the overreaching challenges that we have by 2050, we have more than 9 billion people to feed uh, with climate change stepping on our door. So we need to actually make a stronger committed decision that what is more important for us, getting the product faster, following all the regulations or getting only like regulatory blockage to make it more complicated for the researcher to invest more of their time. Thank you. Uh, Vitu, if I can get a quick comment on that in a minute. Uh, we have just about two minutes to end it all. Yeah, th thank you for very much. And the, I think I just have, I had two points. The other one is what Arif talked about in terms of the policy. Uh, the other one is uh, basically to mention that uh, this product is meant for farmers. So it is very important that I think from the time when we start research, farmers are involved in the process so they know exactly what are we researching on. When farmers know the benefit of the trait that we're researching on, it, the, the job is half done. They'll be the ones asking government that they want this product in their hands and it will be less a job on us as policymakers and, and advocates because farmers are already demanding it on the ground. So that process of involving farmers in the research uh, from the design of the product is what is actually going to give us a breakthrough more than our policy sometimes because Sometimes government would have to change the policy to adapt to what farmers want on the ground. So I'd really want to stress the need for farmers in the process. Thank you. Vitu, you couldn't have summarized it all better. Um, as it's always said, speak to the farmer, let's put the farmers at the center of the entire conversation. That's probably the way to go. Uh, there's a question here from Richard Everett asking, can we be positive about gene editing and breeding without beating up GM? Of course, uh, we are very much uh, positive about gene editing, but the, the point still remains that these are all important breeding techniques, depending on which one fits in a specific scenario, then it's applied to getting uh, the work done in terms of dealing with the challenges. And um, Pablo Orozco, who is actually a convener, couldn't have put it any better as it's been pointed out in the chat. It's a good wake up call. We only have 10 more harvests to achieve the SDG. So, um, 2030 is just about 10 more harvests away as far as the farmer is concerned because then a lot of them grow annual crops and some of them have just a single stretch of space to farm within a year. So then um, 10 more harvests to go to the next SDGs. And as John Comin is pointing out, it's actually down to nine by now. So we are hoping to do our part to ensure that a, a, a better sustained food system is actually created going forward. All these inputs and thoughts that have come up in this conversation will definitely be channeled back to the dialogue gateway as far as the food summit systems uh, are concerned. And so we look forward to this conversation shaping the impact of it. This conversation will be archived on our website and as well, we would have blog posts on it all over on our website and other social media platforms. So thank you all very much for coming. I couldn't be more thankful to Mufi Kosh for uh, helping with all the questions as far as this conversation is concerned. And to all of you from all parts of the world, many thanks for joining us and we look forward to continuing the conversation. This is obviously not the last of it yet, but until we meet again, connect with you on social media and thanks for all the support in helping get improved technology to farmers and the world at large. So 
thank you all very much. Thank you and have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.